Well, welcome to this evening's public talk in Creative Edge. And uh, Creative Edge is the university's um, home for the Department of Media and Department of Computing. My name's Roger Shannon, and I'm the director of ICE, which is one of the university's research institutes. And ICE stands for um, Institute for Creative Enterprise. And it's ICE that's arranged uh, this public talk this evening. ICE functions for the university as a, as a portal connecting the university to the region and nation creative industries. And one of the things that um, ICE has been doing of late is to discuss and survey the new emerging economic narrative for the North called the Northern Powerhouse. And this, this evening is the second of our initiatives. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a round table was held at the university comprising of about 20 um, academics, film producers, and representatives of funding organisations. And we discussed the impact that the notion of the Northern Powerhouse might have on the, the region's um, burgeoning film industry. And it was a really great discussion. And we deci also decided that the wider parameters of um, the cultural industries would be also um, a, good, uh, um, a good focus for discussion and debate. Hence this, this evening's talk by Dr. Ben Wormsley from the University of Leeds, who will be talking about, um, in a polemic and stirring way, about the, um, the emerging plans which um, have come through from George Osborne for the Northern Powers, but particularly about the, uh, the, the nuanced approach to, to culture and creative industries, which so far have, have been um, flowing through that um, new metaphor for the North. So we're, we're in good company as well um, of late running this event uh, because today was, um, so yesterday there was a major uh, full day discussion in Manchester about the impact of the Northern Powerhouse on um, Manchester, uh, its airport, its transport, its, its health service, but also its cultural offer. And this evening, Digby Jones is running a major discussion in Liverpool on the impact that the Northern Powers might have for the Liverpool economy. But tonight our focus is on cultural policy and I'm delighted that our speaker, Ben Wormsley, um, he's had a, a career uh, mainly focused in theatre work and theatre producing and um, has recently began vigorously blogging about the idea of the Northern Powerhouse. And just some highlights from his background, uh, he's currently uh, lecturing in the School of Performance and Cultural Industries at the University of Leeds. But his professional background is in theatre prior to that, working in both France and Scotland. And he worked uh, at the very beginning uh, of the National Theatre for Scotland in 2006, and then in Glasgow. And then he moved into higher education and began working with the University of Leeds. So I'm very pleased that we've got Ben here this evening and I'm sure we'll be stirred and stimulated by uh, his provocation about the cultural policy and the Northern Powerhouse. Thanks, Ben. OK, thanks, Roger, and thanks to everyone at ICE for this invitation. Um, just a, a couple of caveats, really. What, one is that I'm certainly not an expert on the Northern Powerhouse. I'm not sure anyone is. It's, as Roger intimated, something that's still very much emerging and people are still discussing and trying to really get their heads around. Um, so I'm going to try and be polemical. I think that's the, that's the perspective I'm going to take this evening. And really just um, try and throw a few, a few spanners in the works about how the Northern Powerhouse perspective can or, or is or isn't really engaging with notions of cultural policy. Um, <clears throat> the second caveat is that I'm from Yorkshire, which is partly why I got lost and got off at Edge Hill Station as opposed to coming straight here, so apologies for that. Um, but more, I think more relevant, on a more relevant note, um, as David Cameron pointed out very, very controversially recently, people in Yorkshire he said, hate each other even more than they hate other people. 
Um, so that might give you a kind of inkling into the, into the chippy Yorkshire nature of what I'm going to say. And, and that's more, you know, it's more than a, a joke. I think there is a feeling on the other side of the Pennines that Yorkshire and the North East really is being a little bit left behind in, in this kind of game to get on the train of the, the gravy train of the Northern Powerhouse. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for that, not least maybe that certainly Yorkshire can't get its act together. There was some truth, I think, in what David Cameron said. Um, and I think part of that is because there's a real wariness in Yorkshire about what this is and how we can most effectively engage with it. So what I'm hoping to do is to speak for maybe about 25 minutes and then open it up for um, a kind of rigorous discussion. And it would be great for me to get a perspective of, of your views of what's happening in the Northwest in all things to do with the Northern Powerhouse. So, from a polemical perspective, um, I'd like to just start off by suggesting that actually we're in danger of walking or sleepwalking into what is effectively a Northern Power cut, and that the Northern Powerhouse is being used as a little bit of a bribe to get people behind something that has a very, very different and perhaps more sinister agenda. So I thought it would be useful just to start with where the idea and the notion of the Northern Powerhouse came from. And when I started to research this, I was, I was quite shocked, really, by how, um, how recently we've been talking about the Northern Powerhouse, because it seems it's been around for ages. But actually, it was only in June uh, 2014 when George Osborne, of course, in Manchester, <coughs> I'll come back to Manchester, um, argued that the lack of economic and physical connections between cities and city regions in the north of England was holding back their growth. And he said the whole is less than the sum of its parts, so the powerhouse of London dominates more and more. And this is something that we all know in the north of England, isn't it? And I don't know if anyone watched the documentary last year with Evan Davis on London, um, but it, but it, it seems clear to me that London is becoming, even on a kind of comparative international scale, um, very, very unbalanced in the way it dominates the whole of the UK, much more than, say, Paris dominates France, um, and even New York dominates the USA. There's, there's a really unfortunate you know, balance that is absolutely skewed in favour of the capital in the UK. And the North is often um, losing out as a result of that, I would argue. And I think tellingly here, uh, George Osborne described the Northern Powerhouse as not one city, but a collection of northern cities sufficiently close to each other that, that combined they can take on the world. So there's some really lofty rhetoric, I think, in what Osborne's saying. Um, and it's worth remembering, of course, that he is a relatively local MP from the constituency of uh, Tatton in Cheshire. So there's, there's clearly a vested interest in Osborne's rhetoric here, um, not least for his own uh, parliamentary seat, but of course his perhaps future ambitions to become Prime Minister. So where did it come from? Um, Osborne's plan really was partly in response to a call from what at the time were the five core northern cities, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Sheffield and Liverpool, for a £15 billion investment over five years. And I think it's interesting to note here that actually, uh, initially, the powerhouse was about science, transport and infrastructure. So both the arts and culture and Hull came relatively <laughs> late to the party, perhaps as usual in the case of Hull. Um, and it's interesting when you look now at Northern Powerhouse that it has, of course, with the Hull being the UK city of culture for 2017, um, is very much on the agenda, and people are now talking more about the, the M62 corridor of culture, which again I think is really interesting, and you know, can we actually collaborate across the Pennines, God forbid. Um, but when you do that, that of course raises all sorts of questions about Newcastle and the North East. Um, and Newcastle as well seems to have disappeared from uh, these core cities, and it's now just referred to in terms of the, the kind of greater northeastern region. Um, and I think there's an irony that what started actually as something focused on these core cities, however we want to define that, has now morphed into something um, that is really conditional on city regions. 
So the thing Leeds is really struggling with at the moment is kind of is, is who to get into bed with, to be honest. It's, you know, should Leeds go with York and Harrogate, so-called the, the golden triangle around Leeds in terms of wealth and business creation? Or should we have a kind of pan-Yorkshire uh, re- city region? What it isn't, of course, is something that is very much focused on Leeds. And that seems to be part of the deal. You know, you need a mayor and ideally it needs to be a broader city region. Um, and things, I think things really kicked off in terms of the arts and culture when Osborne very controversially pledged £78 million for the factory, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, and the factory is designed to be uh, a brand new, globally uh, significant cultural centre which will regenerate the old Granada Film Studio site and, of course, provide a permanent home for the biannual Manchester International Festival. Um, And I'm going to come back to this later, but I think there's a huge irony that John McGrath, who, of course, is uh, quite rightly respected and renowned for his work, uh, not only at Contact, but at National Theatre of Wales, that doesn't have a building, um, and has been singing the praises of non-building-based arts venues, or arts organisations, sorry, has now found himself really uh, housed, or soon to be housed, in this £78 million white elephant, which is looking likely to be. A white elephant. Um, and as white elephants go, it's interesting to note that already the budget for this 2,200 seater theatre has now ballooned to £110 million. So goodness knows what the final uh, budget will uh, end up being. Also controversially, I think, it's worth noting that Simon Meller, um, Executive Director of Arts and Culture at Arts Council England, has recently been named project director of the factory. So if that isn't a conflict of interest, then I'm not quite sure what is. Um, And again, people in the arts and culture uh, on the other side of the Pennines are really starting to ask questions about about objectivity at Arts Council England at the moment. And the latest news, thanks to Roger, uh, I've kept up to date with what's happening in Liverpool, is that now Liverpool not only has its new film studios in the Littlewoods building, it now uh, has designs to have a great opera house of the north, um, which is, on the back of the factory, clearly a huge investment that Liverpool perhaps doesn't need. And with all the talk about you know, dying audiences for opera, arguably it's something that we don't have provision for in terms of audiences in the north of England either. Um, I'm just going to share a very quick um, two-minute clip from Abigail Gilmore from the University of Manchester, who talks a little bit about how Manchester is perceived and Manchester's goals in terms of this northern powerhouse. The arts and creative industries contribute to city-region economies. They export locally made cultural products and attract tourists to flagship venues and mega events like Liverpool 08, European Capital of Culture. Vibrant creative communities also mobilise creative human capital to move to places where they can access bohemian lifestyles, cafes, museums and theatres and create further economic growth. Creative industries have been central to the identity of cities, whether it's the Beatles or the Tate in Liverpool, industrial bleep music in Sheffield, and Tony Wilson's factory records and the Hacienda in Manchester, or Newcastle Gatehead's iconic public art. Local cultural production often reflects past social and economic conditions, the local structures of feeling described by Raymond Williams. Our research on contemporary visual arts scenes show how cheaper housing and studio space and smaller, more intimate networks are making northern cities attractive places for artists to live and work. Devolution agenda raises questions about cultural policy for the north. There is huge disparity in the levels of arts funding in London compared to the regions. At the same time, local authorities have been hard pressed to keep arts budgets safe amongst swinging cuts and some have lost them completely. In July 2015, 
Manchester City Council announced a new £110 million cultural venue called The Factory, designed to be a globally competitive production space and engine room for the Northern Powerhouse. It was part of the devolution deal with Greater Manchester in George Osborne's preceding autumn budget. New buildings are not the only way to stimulate local creative economies. Entry and progression routes into the creative workforce through education, incubation and training require more coordination between local employers and institutions and across primary, secondary and higher education to encourage retention of talent and skills. So the challenges for a powerhouse which drives the northern creative economy go much wider than targeted investment in one site in Manchester if the benefits are to be realised across the north. So I think two things are particularly worth noting there. The first is this rhetoric again from Osborne around what he calls the devolution deal uh, that I might counter is perhaps a devolution bribe. Um, and the second is Abigail Gilmore's contention here that it isn't just about buildings. There are very other, more effective ways of spreading wealth through the creative industries in the north of England. Um, and I think on that note, it's, it's important to actually consider how these policy decisions and how these funding, huge, significant funding decisions, have actually been made. Um, and I have it on very good authority that the factory, the £78 million guarantee from Osborne, was the result of a 10-minute meeting that Maria Bolshoi at, at the Whitworth Gallery negotiated with George Osborne. Um, and I think this raises really important questions about how cultural policy in particular, but policy perhaps more generally, how decisions get made at that level. And the work certainly of uh, scholars like Melissa Nisbet, who's working at King's, has pointed out through qualitative interviews that civil servants often give money to people. Um, you know, policy doesn't come up always through the correct channels and mechanisms from the bottom up, as we probably know. It's given for, uh, from people to people. So one of Melissa's interviews with senior civil servants, um, there were, they were a bunch of civil servants on a plane uh, going to a global conference, uh, and they asked themselves what they could actually do for Neil McGregor. So, so policy really became about how can we do favours for people that we like? How can we keep things within the club? And I think this is a really good illustration of what's happening with this Northern Powerhouse agenda. Um, and when I took a step back and, and calmed down a little bit and tried to put my academic hat on and theorise this a little bit, um, I was really struck by the work of Eleonora Belfiore at Warwick um, and to Ellie's work on uh, what she calls cultural bullshitting. So Ellie here says that, you know, there's a prevalence of bullshitting in the contemporary public sphere. And she goes on to argue that many of the key actors in the cultural policy debate are completely indifferent to how things really are and actually cultivate vested interests. Um, now, this, of course, was written uh, in 2009, a long time before Osborne had probably even dreamed up the idea of the Northern Powerhouse. But I think it's really prescient in really, you know, hitting what the problem is with this, with this whole perspective and this initiative and this drive, in that it's really all about vested interest. It's not about what's best for culture and the arts in the north of England, I would argue. And then I started to, th to look at the national funding picture for the arts in the UK, or certainly in England in this case. And what's clear to see from this chart over the past five or six years is a decline in public funding for the arts, which again is perhaps no surprise to any of us. But what's really happened has been that as public funding uh, from the Treasury to DCMS has been in decline, so has National Lottery uh, been on the rise. Um, and this has led certainly Conservative politicians to argue that arts funding has remained relatively stable. Um, actually, it's uh, over the, past, the, the five years of the coalition government saw about a £9 million decrease. But I think in the great scheme of things, that isn't particularly horrendous. What is worrying is that, of course, National Lottery is a lottery. Um, it means that funding isn't guaranteed to the arts and culture. And if that money is diverted or stops trickling in, and 
facts are that it trickles in mainly from the north of the country and from working class communities, then the arts and culture will be even further at risk. Um, Anna Stark and colleagues pointed out in their now infamous Rebalancing Our Cultural Capital report, the facts and figures really don't paint a very positive picture in terms of how arts and cultural funding is balanced across England. Um, and so in their work they've pointed out that in 2012-13, taxpayers and lottery players provided a benefit of £86.41 per head of the population in London, compared to a rather paltry £8.48 per head of the population in the rest of England, which of course translates into um, under 10% of London levels. Um, this, of course, uh, now famously ended up in a parliamentary inquiry where Arts Council England were actually told to sort it out. So the findings of the report were that London receives a share of arts funding which is, quote, out of all proportion to its population and that this clear funding imbalance must be urgently rectified. I think the question is whether or not the Northern Powerhouse is serving to rectify this imbalance or not. Um, and when I pointed out these funding disparities for a piece in the conversation, Dave O'Brien, who's um, a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths, quite rightly got back and pointed out that, that one of the real concerns is also what's happening with um, local government and, and local government funding to the arts and culture. So it's almost a pincer movement on the arts and culture or a double-pronged attack. And if, again, we just look at some of the figures of what's been happening over the past five years to local authorities. Um, we can see that five, six years ago, Arts Council England was reporting that local authorities were investing over 100 million in their regularly funded arts organisations. So a huge part of arts funding uh, nationally was provided by local government. As we know, um, over the past five, six years, uh, funding to local authorities has been cut by 28%. Um, and in the past few years, some councils have now imposed 100% cuts on their arts budgets, which is almost unfathomable, isn't it? Um, and I've looked at these 13 authorities, and for the purposes of the North, the two that currently have no funding whatsoever for culture and heritage are Selby and Wigan. So at least it's balanced out one either side of the Pennines, I guess. Um, and as the Shadow Minister for Culture, Hel Helen Goodman, pointed out last May, that most deprived of England's local authority areas have cut the arts, libraries and heritage by 22%. So again, these cuts are not proportionately metered out over the whole of the country. And in the next few weeks, of course, we're going to find out whether uh, DCMS and Arts Council England will receive 20% or perhaps the maximum 40% of further cuts to something that's already really, really struggling. So, um, what do I think about all of this? And th this is when I'm going to be really polemical and just maybe throw this out for a debate after this talk. First of all, as I've hinted, I think this uh, devolution deal of Osborne is actually a bribe. And I, I suppose the question is, what's in it for, for him or for the Conservative government? Um, the bribe, of course, is, unless cities get their act together, form city regions and have an elected mayor there won't be a deal, they won't get the money. In terms of the arts and culture, as we've seen with the factory, this £78 million, now £110 million uh, white elephant, and now Liverpool's seeming interest in um, you know, jumping on the Sydney Opera House bandwagon, perhaps, it's all about buildings. And most people working in the arts and culture will tell you that the last thing we need at the moment, certainly in the north of England, is more buildings. <clears throat> that £78 million could really be invested much more strategically and artistically in artists and in audiences, in making work happen. So my argument would be, let's invest in product and production rather than in buildings to house it. Um, my other contention against the Northern Powerhouse is that it's all about cities. What does the powerhouse mean for rural communities? What does it mean for counties like North Yorkshire, which is the biggest county in England and has most of its um, region as rural 
bits of the country. Where will they be supported in this very, very core city and region focused policy making? Um, I would perhaps cheekily contend it's all about George Osborne and about his future ambitions and of course his local constituency. But it's also all about people and it actually perpetuates the cult of the personality. So when you have senior cultural policy civil servants saying, what can we do for Neil? What can we do for Neil McGregor? What can we do for Maria Bolshaw? I think we're really in trouble. We're not looking at the, at the policy issues. We're not listening to the taxpayers. We're giving money from the public purse to certain uh, well-known people. Another issue I have is that it's not sustainable. Um, I was asked actually just after this announcement to, to talk to the BBC's breakfast show about where the demand is from audiences for new buildings like the factory. Um, how can Manchester, which has just had a uh, million spent on the Whitworth Gallery, a further £24 million spent on the new home venue, fantastic as it is, how, how can that city possibly, that also has the Lowry and the Salford development, um, cope with another huge empty building that it has to put work and cultural products into? Where's the audience drive for that? Where's the demand? I think it encourages vanity projects. Um, people often like to be linked to flagship buildings, and the very word flagship that's been used all the time around these buildings is, I think, hugely problematic. It's not about people, it's about um, projects. And I think the, the way that policy has been made in terms of the powerhouse, and certainly in the area of the arts and culture, has been very much on the hoof. So I'd like to, uh, to throw open for debate the contention that actually a lot of this is cultural policy bullshit uh, in the best sense of Ellie Belfiore's critique. Um, and I'm not just going to be polemical, I'm actually going to leave you with an alternative model, which is the model of the National Theatre of Scotland, of course a little bit biased on that one, um, but also the National Theatre of Wales, which I think have proven in the past 10 years, it's now the 10th anniversary of the National Theatre of Scotland, um, that there is a different way to do things, that the arts can function really, really well if they, uh, if they produce with the existing infrastructure. You know, certainly in Scotland, there are hundreds of incredible artistic venues and buildings. <coughs> and the people behind the development of the National Theatre of Scotland were really adamant that the last thing the country needed were further theatres. So both of these models have been set up to work with the existing <coughs> infrastructure. And so all of that investment, it was about four and a half million pounds when I worked there from the Scottish Government, went straight into creating work, um, not into uh, keeping buildings going or investing in new buildings. So there are new ways of doing things. And I think the question maybe for us in the north of England is to ask ourselves what this model might look like if we transferred it um, north of London and south of the Scottish border. Thank you very much. Can we just, can we just go back to the slide where there's the Liverpool skyline? No, you just passed it. OK, there we are. There we go. Um, so that's um, a mock-up, I suppose, of how the waterfront would look if the Sydney Opera House was reborn uh, beside um, the Liber building. The, the Liverpool the Echo, I think, that wasn't it, the image. <laughs> Should have credited it. So there's an opportunity now to um, pick up some of the points that um, Ben's made. And um, I'd just like to kick it off by... Uh, asking Ben uh, the following question, which is that um, does he think that the, the arguments about the factory and possibly the Liverpool Opera House, etc., are replaying one of the criticisms of the, the lottery funding, which led to the Sheffield Centre for Popular Music and the public in the West Midlands, whereby um, large buildings were constructed, large amounts of capital funding went in, but in the end there was neither the revenue 
support to keep them going, nor the, the audience numbers. So it's the, what they call the, the Bilbao Guggenheim effect, that mm. you put a big sh um, uh, showy, in a sense, a flagship building, but um, they become silos, so often empty silos, mm. because the, audi the audience level isn't there. Is, do you, that's your argument, isn't it? It is, essentially, yeah. And I, I think we, you know, evidence shows and history tells us that we haven't learned that lesson, that we keep making the same mistakes, we keep replicating these policy errors. Um, and as we all know, buildings suck up a huge amount of resources. And these are really, in the arts and culture, vital resources that need to be desperately spent elsewhere. So I think it, it's, it's utterly unfathomable that we haven't learned from past mistakes in Sheffield. There are exceptions, of course. Doncaster's cast is uh, doing very well, I think, in building audiences slowly. Um, I think home is, is doing very well, but it's very early days for Manchester. Yes, that's true. I mean, I was, I was in home recently and uh, I know that oh, they've got five cinema screens. All the cinema screens are running at capacity mm. and uh, the theatre there is also doing very well. So a project like Home, which I think was um, substantially less funded than the 75 million for the factory, um, yeah. um, is proving uh, to be a success, even though um, uh, one wonders whether the larger development of the factory with a theatre size of 2000 is going to either um, nip the development of home in the bud because mm. maybe the theatre goers will go there or maybe home will do well and the factory will become a memorial to Tony Wilson's echo chamber. In a way. Indeed, yeah. I mean, home is in a very strategic place, isn't it, in Manchester? It can tap into the student market. It's programming really challenging work, which, which is difficult, of course, in itself in terms of uh, audience development. Um, but home are very worried about the, uh, the prospect of the factory, as you would be. You know, it will only increase um, competition, it will only increase provision in a city that already has a huge amount of arts and cultural provision, something that people mm -hmm. in Leeds are very looking on very enviously Well, I at. wonder whether I could, because um, Dave Moutry, the director of Home, is here. There he is, Dave. I just wondered, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but, but I know you like to be put on the spot, so... <laughs> So I wondered whether you'd like to... Oh, blimey, that's loud. Um, I'm sorry I arrived late. Um, if ever there was a need for the Northern Powerhouse, which actually started off as a transport project, um, getting <laughs> here from Manchester is a, is, 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 is a justification for it. Um, so I'm sorry, I apologise for arriving late. I really don't like doing that. Um, uh, the, the, the second thing is I, I, I want to say is that I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, uh, academia is not something that I'm familiar with. Um, uh, it's a long time since I, I graduated, so being introduced to new academic terminology like bullshit is really <laughs> quite gratifying. Um, uh, and, and it's always good to come to uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the west coast of the country to find it out. Um, the, the, uh, we aren't worried about, ho uh, about factory uh, at, at home. We welcome it. Um, I, I, I would want. To, I wouldn't want. To, I was worried a bit about taking issue with academics because you've obviously done all your research and stuff. But I have to say, factory didn't happen because of a ten-minute uh, conversation with Maria Bolshaw. Factory is is happening because of twenty years of investment in cultural policy in Manchester consistently. That's why it's happening. Um, uh, it's happening because after the first international festival. Um, uh, Alex Poots started a conversation with the Chief Executive of the City Council, Howard Bernstein, um, uh, about the need for a venue to do the sort of work that they want to do, a turbine hall for the North. Um, that's what it was about, it was about bringing international projects that at the moment can only play at the Rua Tree and Arle uh, venues or uh, uh, work out at the, uh, uh, the armories in New York, etc. That there isn't the sort of venue for that at the moment. Uh, so that's where it came from. Um, uh, I think the name came from a 10 minute conversation with, um, between Maria Bolshaw. Um, Maria is, in, in many senses, coming late to this project because this project came out of a conversation, as I say, between uh, Alex Poots and Sir Howard Bernstein. And at one stage, was looking like, uh, likely to be um, about bringing the, uh, the Royal Opera to a refurbished uh, Manchester Palace Theatre. And that, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because um, a 2,000 seat lyric theatre isn't what Manchester or the North needs. It needs something much more flexible. And that's what factory is. And so there's a lot of myths and, myths and mythology out there about what it might be, when in actual fact, 
it's it, 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 it's something that is there is a gap outside of London for um, th there is a gap on the international network for and it's something that we think if given the right uh, uh, trajectory and the pathway into uh, its opening will will be good for audience for all of us can I just yeah, come back back quickly yeah. yeah I mean just to say I have spoken to people at home who are worried about it um, also, uh, I think in different times it might be justifiable to spend that amount of money on a new venue that possibly we need in the north of England. But I think there are two questions. One, is it in the right location? Is too much of the money going to the northwest of England? Uh, and what does that mean for the northeast? Um, and secondly, you know, do we, do we need more investment in certainly an opera house, say, in Liverpool, when Opera North is struggling to maintain its audiences across the country and already tours quite successfully to uh, the Lowry in Salford. So I think, you know, given that the times that we're in, it's very, very difficult to justify that kind of expenditure um, on a building that could be spent much more effectively elsewhere. Thanks, Dave. I think it was Howard Bernstein and Maria Bolsher who, who yes. got the 10 minutes, to be, to be fair, but, but yes. I mean, just to make the point that... I, I'm, I'm sorry, it was a 10 minute conversation, but that came at the end of several conversations that have been going on for several years. Yes, I understand in, that. In, 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 and, and, um, uh, sorry. Um, I can't speak for the City Council. I've just worked, I mean, I've worked in Manchester for 30 years and, uh, uh, and, and know the city pretty well. Um, but uh, Howard, uh, Howard is, uh, is the chief executive, he's not the politician. So Richard Lease uh, actually um, is, 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 is a, a very accomplished politician and works very carefully to make sure that the city's got a long term strategy that it delivers on. And Howard is at the pointy end of that. But Howard doesn't run the city. I mean, you know. The, it's, the city's not run by the Sopranos. It's, a, it's actually a, it's a de democratic local authority that works with a, very pu with a clear published policy. In fact, if you want to have a look at Manchester's cultural policy, Manchester's policy, I should say, it's, its strategy for the next 20 years, it's out for consultation on the website. And one of the top 10 things in there that they're looking for is, is an arts and cultural infrastructure that makes the place a livable city. It's in there and it has been for 20 years. This isn't something that's just happened. It happens under the radar. One thing we don't do in Manchester is wash our dirty linen in public. We also don't discuss our detailed plans in public. We, make, we work on them uh, until the time's right for them to happen. So it, it's not sort of just something that's come out of thin air. Um, I, I, I really worry when that, 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 that idea's there. I, take, I also take your point about, um, uh, uh, about the times that we're in. Um, but the, the, we're talking about capital money, not revenue. Um, uh, this is something that will sit on a country's ba uh, on, on balance sheet as opposed to going out the door on a, on, on, on a few projects. It will have a long-term benefit. Um, that's why home was built. It was capital money, not revenue money. So, it, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ranting, mate. I should shut up. So, there's a question here. Yes, you may. Yeah, you take the mic. Cause take the mic, please. I'll take the mic when it's arrived. It's there now. If I can, I'll, I'll thank you. I wanted to shift into some of the other issues on there about it's all about buildings, it, it, it's not sustainable and it encourages vanity projects which are sort of distant from the personalities side, entertaining as it was of, as the, of the stuff that you, you did. I, I think I'd also want to chuck in that I, I think I'd start talking about the Northern Powerhouse a lot earlier than you did, I, that, that language wasn't used. But I see a strong connection with, with uh, John Prescott's Northern Way, yeah. um, which was also about vanity projects, albeit in a different way. It's about a concept of regeneration. I'm, I'm from uh, Tranmere in, um, in Wirral, and uh, we suffered from the benefit, as many others in many other northern cities have done, from the, the sort of slash and burn approach towards regeneration and handover naked sites to the uh, private sector builders, uh, that we, which spent vast amounts of money. In my area, Tranmere, 53 million pounds to knock down houses, full stop. Still not a brick built on top of another one since. And that went over about 15 years. And that, but that was driven by the idea that if we can take a lot of public money invested in certain sorts of very visible projects, 
then that somehow by osmosis will generate more economy. I, I would say that one of the, I, I, I enjoyed moving into and, and spending time around Liverpool. I, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not actually a Liverpoolian, much more from just up north of here. But uh, I, actually the biggest transformation of Liverpool was the investment by a very big private sector company, um, Grosvenor, um, into what is now Liverpool One, which has totally transformed and stitched together the city. And that was a billion pounds of private money moving in and, and uh, has made a massive impact. Some of the cultural benefits that have flown thereafter um, are, if, as it were, almost on the back of that. I don't know whether I'd say that about Manchester or not, the city I love, but, but I, I, I'm not sure. I, I do worry about the buildings thing. Um, about the investment in buildings. We've seen, I could give you small scale examples in my part of the world of buildings that were vanity projects and you've, you've not heard of Pacific Road, have you? That's a local authority vanity project, an extra theater when we didn't need one. And it's been empty for the last sort of, uh, I don't know, a year, three, four years. It's just been reopened as a new, a new vamped business center. Um, um, which was a, th a theatre, which was something else before. So I, I, I'm I intrigued by your uh, Scottish uh, National Theatre, National Theatre Scotland concept of giving money to people who are making culture, and I think that's probably worth a lot more exploration and promotion. I'm not quite sure how how we can do it when our politicians are so fixated on building like that monstrosity in the middle of the Mersey. <laughs> Um, thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting, and it's caused some debate, which is always a, a good thing. Um, depending on how you look at the lens, Manchester's got its act together, would be one view of that, uh, and it's taking advantage of that and receiving investment. Why, why do you think the other cities are, are behind that? And you alluded to it in Leeds, Newcastle, Hull. Yeah, no, good, good point. And, you know, just on the Manchester thing, I was being deliberately provocative and polemical. Manchester has got its act together, and, and I totally take on board this is, you know, the end of a long-term strategy. Um, other cities haven't, I think, for all sorts of reasons. You know, Leeds voted uh, two or three years ago not to, ha not to have an elected mayor. So it's, it's a really anti-democratic process to now kind of bribe us that we have to have a mayor, otherwise we're not getting the money. So I think that's one thing with Leeds. The other with Leeds is that, and you obviously know Leeds, so using that as a, as a case study, Leeds, believe it or not, still does not have a cultural strategy, um, which, given that we're bidding for European City of Culture 2023, is a real problem. <laughs> so we are very enviously looking over at Manchester, who have clearly got their act together. Uh, I think, just, just you know, following up on your point, the, the problem is maybe even for Manchester, I would argue, they're lobbying for the wrong things. I don't think Manchester needs necessarily other buildings, but I do think other cities in the north have a hell of a lot to learn from Manchester's joined-up approach and also the way that Manchester's worked with Salford very, very effectively. Leeds and Bradford have never really managed to do that, so there's a lot to learn from Manchester. Can I just say, um, just um, one or two observations, really. I mean, here we are now, we're in West Lancashire, and... Um, West Lancashire borders Merseyside, and we are part of the Liverpool city region, but we're also part of Lancashire, and it's almost as if we don't quite know which, which way to face, because we are quite a very rural area. But as a, um, a, 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 as a Tory councillor, I've got some sympathy with what you say, but I think you've missed off one thing, really, and that is to have a northern powerhouse, whether it's for employment, whether it's for the arts. Let's go back to basics. You need to be able to get people from A to B. And from my experience of traveling on a daily basis to Manchester and other parts of this area, I mean, the point was alluded to just then, with one or two exceptions in this area, our, our transport is not fit for purpose. So the idea of building, okay, that's a bit of a, a, bit of a joke, but the, but the idea of building something like that in Liverpool or building something equally as good in Manchester, unless you can get customers, bums on seats to go from A to B around this area, it's gonna be a waste of time. And, you know, clearly London does get a lot of, of, of investment in this area. They've had Crossrail. I think I've heard people talk about a Crossrail 2, is it now, or Crossrail 3, whatever. Yeah. They get a fortune spent on them down there. Mm. Up here, we have, I mean, especially around here in West Lancashire, we, I mean, I've, this is a, a bone of contention I've been involved in for quite a long time. 
trying to get like small, very, very small disused railway lines reopened at a cost of last estimate was five, six, seven million pounds. It, it's just not going to happen. So it's, unless we can get people around this area, around this northern powerhouse area more effectively than we are now, I think it may well be about cities and buildings because people may not be able to go there. I mean, there, there, does, there does seem to be an emphasis on cities in, in uh, the, the arguments made about the Northern Power so far. And uh, I have noticed in, in much of the press that's been generated recently that the rural areas that aren't in the cities, have, like, I'm, I, to back up your argument, I mean, areas like West Lanx and the rural parts of Lancashire that fall in between Liverpool and Manchester and then parts of Yorkshire, that um, the, the emphasis is on conurbations and... Mm. urban places but I think also that it's um, the initial argument from George Osborne was about how to make the cities across the north with their collective population equivalent to something like Tokyo how to make the, the connections into a global conurbation which suggests a different image and um, metaphor for the north you know it's a very different um, image of the north that they're, they're presenting in this and it doesn't yet seem to be one that could show how the impact in the cities then filters out into the, the local rural areas. And I think that's a really important point that you're making about this part of Lancashire, is that if large cultural projects get built in the adjacent cities, I mean, if you can't get to them, there's no point having them. So perhaps the initial infrastructural d imperative on transport etc was really the right approach to go except maybe um, it, it's not as sophisticated as it should be because then it would connect up these smaller communities but can I have uh, can I uh, yeah can I have you first and then you and then um, Maria and then Dave at the back yeah uh, you've been talking extensively about the management of change now as a humble consumer when do you take, when do you canvas and how do you um, put into practice the views of the consumer during your policy making? Now, and you mentioned the word, it, things are not sustainable. Nothing is sustainable unless you take on board the views of the consumer. How do you canvas that and how do you implement it in your policy making decisions? That's a really good point and, and people are talking a lot more um, about participatory decision making and budgeting actually and of course there are examples in Brazil and Scandinavia where money is given over to communities to spend on arts and cultural provision so I yeah, completely agree, it, it's again anti-democratic isn't it? Well it's not, nothing is sustainable Mm. You've not really answered my question. Well, I, th I think one way, a tangible way of making a difference would be if Arts Council England were much closer to its audiences and, and actually listened to what people, what, to what audiences wanted. Uh, and then they may be in a position to say, we don't need another building, we need more uh, provision in our rural communities in, in different communities. There's very, very little of that consultation that's going on apart from uh, biannual uh, taking part kind of that's household survey. Right. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with you. Yes, yep. Hi. Um, I, I agreed with your, your presentation. I think it was, it was very pertinent. Um, but something that I think is missing, actually, is that there's a morality issue at the heart of it, at the heart of spending £110 million on bricks and mortar, when I don't know if you saw the letter in The Guardian today to the, from the Oxford's, Oxfordshire City Council leader, to uh, David Cameron, and it's a Tory council, but he was basically saying, you know, we've cut back to complete core services, yeah. and it's getting to the point now where children, the elderly, and kind of the most vulnerable in society are not going to have any provision made for them, and I think it's really difficult. I mean, I work in the arts, I fully appreciate the value of the arts on society, but I don't know how you can have a society that's crumbling and not taking care of the people who need it most, and then spend that money 
on an inner city building that not necessarily going to have bums on seats every night. In fact, it's definitely not. Just as an addendum as well, <laughs> I find it really funny that they want to have an opera house in Liverpool because I'm a massive <laughs> opera fan. I'm like a huge opera geek. Welsh National Opera do tours, um, and they do they tour the smaller operas as well. Well, they're not this year; they're doing some time, which is rubbish. But um, they did like Jephtha by Handel, and they did um, uh, Catchy Cabanova by Janáček, and there was like nobody there. And the tickets are six quid, so I don't think there's a base for it in Liverpool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and then uh, there, in front. No, just in front. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm from Liverpool and I think you're probably right. I'm, um, I'm not going to fight for our opera house here. Uh, but I really enjoyed that and, and found it quite provocative and quite interesting. I thought one of the things that you've described is a classical cultural policy dilemma because it's about shall we do the top down, uh, albeit the oh, uh, apparently there, there have been stuff going on but that's not necessarily public but given that sort of level of discussion whatever that is but it's top down it's not from the ground up it's not grassroots it's not about people it's about flagship and this has been going on as Roger said um, it was typical of the lottery but actually for the last 80 years since the founding of the Arts Council and part of the problem with that I think is that it's naturally more attractive for any politician to say look at what I made look at what I built and how do we move away from that and I think uh, I, I just wanted wondered if you could talk more about the National Theatre of Scotland thing are they better than us are they more democratic than us do they air their discussions in public in a way that we don't what happened there to make something seemingly much more successful for ordinary people and not just um, for politicians yeah thanks maria i think i mean you're right and it's interesting and it's important actually to go back to the founding of of the arts council which of course was around covent garden and funding elite london institutions and, and again you have to ask how much or little have we learned from the past 60 years of, of Arts Council funding? Um, I think Scotland is fundamentally different, isn't it? I, th I think it is more democratic in a very different way as the recent um, uh, debate north of the border highlighted. And I think in the arts and culture, I mean, Scotland is a, is a very, very rural country, much, obviously much more so than England is. So there are, there are questions and challenges of provision and infrastructure that we don't have here. So that I think there's always been uh, a more powerful rural lobby and more focus on getting out to rural communities. So that was very much part of it. Um, I think as well, given the size of the population and, the, and how close you know, the central belt is in Scotland, it, it's a village in the arts and culture. Everyone knows each other. Um, and I think that really helped to generate a, a kind of cohesive agreement about what would work for the country um, and out of that came this this realization that the last thing the sector needed were more buildings you know in order for this to to work for the national theater to work and not to eat up money and take it away from existing organizations they had to work collaboratively um, and in england i think the problem is you know it's partly the north south divide we don't work collaboratively in that way partly because we're bigger and partly because there is this kind of historical imbalance. This uh, gentleman down here was speaking about the transport agenda. Um, and and <coughs> I, I was jokingly talking at the beginning about transport being uh, an important part of this. Um, the Northern Powerhouse as a concept happened because the leaders of local authorities in the north of England um, were trying to put pressure on the government to invest in, in, in HS3 ostensibly, but also just improving the, the uh, east-west rail links. I mean, it's ridiculous that it, I can get to London quicker than I can get to Newcastle from Manchester. It's bizarre. Um, the, so so um, that, was, that was the start of it. Over, what's been overlaid on top of that is now the devolution agenda. And, and, and again, Ma Manchester, because of its 30, 30 years of political stability, basically, because hell will freeze over before it's anything other than red, um, uh, they were seen to be a good bet. 
um, uh, to try the devolution thing out. So we've, we've got devolution of skills and training, and um, we've got devolution of, 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 of transport policy, in, in, in which we've been looking for for a long time, but also, on top of that, devolution of the health agenda. So on Monday, I was part of a conversation with health professionals in Manchester talking about how arts and health will work together. As part. These are really interesting conversations. In a sense, uh, the, the factory thing, because it seems to be a big, shiny thing, uh, is a distraction from some, some of the larger other parts of the work that, that are going on that, that are actually much more rooted um, in, in some of the things that are being talked about. So it's not just about a building. And, and I, I would just reiterate that that building comes at the end of 20 years of policy, and it's something that the city's been working towards for a long time. It's not just parachuting. If I may say one last thing, as well. for my uh, colleagues and friends in Liverpool, I don't think for one moment what's been talked about is an opera house on the front. I think the opera house is used as a metaphor for a landmark building that will have a use. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the Liverpool Echo's got really great um, journalistic cred credentials, but I would, I, I would just hesitate uh, at, at lambasting my uh, esteemed colleagues in Liverpool for an opera house when I suspect that's not what they're talking about. Uh, just, just picking up on that last point, really, um, about devolution, I mean, two, well, I suppose two things. One, um, there's a lot of work that's been done for a very long time in different subject areas, looking at functional urban regions, polycentric urban regions, relationships between governments, uh, local government in the north, and so on. So it's interesting that some of this has come back 15 years later after quite a lot of that work was done, work by people like the Core Cities Group, um, looking at the relationships uh, across the Pennines, and actually looking at the kind of counterweight arguments about how the North could operate in relation to London. So some of this is very old, I think, and yeah. as, as a few people have already said. I think one of the new things, perhaps, I wonder, you know, it's just a speculation, really, um, about what forced the issue. And I think this comes back to Scotland. I think it's partly about the independence referendum, actually, and the way in which federalism became a, a topic for political debate. So actually, some of this also is about, you know, a few weeks before the independence referendum in Scotland, of demonstrating some kind of commitment to a devolution agenda and you know following through with that with various promises so i think there's something about the northern powerhouse and the moment as well and i think it has to be situated perhaps in that in that context i think it does and and the elephant in the room almost was the nhs and, until it was raised there and i think what really worries me regardless of the arts and culture is that this devolution bribe will be used as an excuse to blame the regions for a failing and underfunded NHS, actually. I think that's probably really behind the agenda. It's not about the arts, I mean, let's be honest. I'm, I'm using the arts as, as a kind of illustrative case study uh, of what can go wrong. But I think there are really worrying <coughs> questions and, and implications of the powerhouse for um, divestment in public funding, and not least in the NHS. Thank you. Um, I found your polemic very interesting, actually. Um, I don't know whether, the, whether there is such a thing as Northern other than just a label, because it seems to me that you've been describing a series of dysfunctional powerhouses called cities that appear to be totally incapable of getting their act together. Why? Because it seems to me there's never been a regional conscience in this country, whether it's county or whatever. I also, and now I'll be polemical, um, I absolutely agree with, with the colleague at the top there who said that uh, it takes more time to get to Newcastle than it, <laughs> yeah. It takes more time to get to, uh, to Manchester from Southport. What was fundamental to this, I think, though badly thought out and cobbled together because of fear of what was happening in Scotland, it, what was fundamental to this, culture wasn't the driver, it was one of the pillars. It was actually developing the transport infrastructure and it was also about developing the physical infrastructure of cities and actually the other bits, culture, that we're all quite interested in, though I'm interested in the transport, because I think about what the French did in actually not into... I don't go along with you if you think, well, other cities are as culturally important as Paris. Let's not get too carried away. 
they are more important, but the, the development of the transport infrastructure and the fit, you know, was absolutely crucial over the last 20 years. We haven't done that. We're not going to do that. And even if we are going to do that, and I guess they are going to build H, whatever it is, 2 or 3, that doesn't really connect up the north. It simply connects up the north to the south in a way that's quicker, as long as they get it past Tory MPs and whatever else. So there's a disconnect in terms of timing, if you like. How long is it going to take before the rail network is built? 20 years? Another? Well, it, I dare say that, that one will not enjoy it, or certainly I won't. Uh, but that dimension about regional connections will mean that actually the disconnect between your part of the Pennines and that great city of Hull that I swore allegiance to 25 years ago and still do, um, and this part of the world will remain. And I think until northern politicians, northern cities, actually get together regardless of their political complexion and really argue for developing the infrastructure, the transport infrastructure in particular, between north, northern areas, let me call it that way, urban or otherwise, you know, nothing will change, basically. I think Manchester have done a brilliant job, to be, to be candid. I think Liverpool, it, it's a little bit like Naples. I'm of Italian origin. It reminds me very much of Naples. Uh, but um, very, very interesting, but not a bribe. Well, I think France is an interesting comparator, isn't it? Because, I mean, I'm actually a, a fan of HS2, but uh, the, the TGV from Paris <coughs> to Lyon, studies about that have shown that most of the benefits incurred from that went to Paris, not to Lyon. Um, so I completely take your point about, you know, we need the, the northern cities and regions need to work much more cohesively together. And I think they have done to some extent, which has led to the northern powerhouse <laughs> in the first place. Um, what I would like to see is, is a much more critical approach and, and a kickback against what's being proposed in terms of the Northern Powerhouse. Because in terms of transport, it was, the money was there, and then it wasn't, and then it was again. So, you know, the North is being toyed with, isn't it? And I think at the same time, it's, you know, from this London-centric perspective, there is a tendency to lump all the North together. And as we all know, it's far more complex than that. Not least because it is a highly rural area. Um, so, you know, there, there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and I think that's the one problem I have at the moment with this kind of city-region focus on the Northern Powerhouse. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, draw tonight's talk to a close. We've just gone beyond seven. And I'd um, like to thank Ben for coming over from the neglected part of the North <laughs> to, to talk about the Northern Powerhouse and to uh, offer us such a... Um, stimulating and polemical approach to uh, a narrative that's going to play out over the next decades, uh, more like a long-running series than, than just a short film, I suspect. Uh, this is the second uh, Northern Powerhouse <coughs> initiative that ICE has been involved with. Uh, we'll generate a third one coming into the new year at some point. And I'd just like to finish by um, uh, promoting our next Tate and Edge Hill connected um, talk, which is on December the 2nd, when we'll be uh, investigating Tate's new exhibition uh, called the Imaginary Museum, when Tate curator Darren P and Icon, uh, Icon Deputy Director Debbie Commode will be here to talk about that. But for this evening, uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you.